we go. Let's finish up some pedigrees. So this one here, oh, with pedigrees, these are very much problems of you got to practice them over and over and over again. I will supply you with this week's problem set. I'm just not sure about the last question. Everything else is done, but I don't know what that fourth question is going to be because it depends on how far we get. Um, I'll supply you with lots of pedigree problems to work because it's very much, you just need to practice over and over and over again. And doing the same problem over and over doesn't really help you. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a rare, last time we said what rare meant. There, if it gets dropped, we mean something by it. It means we can assume people marrying in or mating in don't have the trait. They're not carriers. They don't have it in any way, shape, or form. That is the assumption. Unless provided with other information, we assume they don't have it. It's also sex-linked recessive. Because of that, it usually affects males. Okay. Individuals with the disease progressively become weaker, starting in early life, and most of them die before reaching adulthood. Have any of you taken a physiology class? Did you learn about what dystrophin does? Because it explains muscular dystrophy. Dystrophin holds the sarcomere to the cell membrane. So in English, what happens if you have muscular dystrophy is the muscle contraction, so the contractile mechanisms, shorten, and the cell stays the same length because they're not connected. So the inside shortens, but the outside of the muscle cell stays the same, which means, congratulations, it doesn't matter. The muscle didn't do anything. And that's why you get progressively weaker, and it just gets worse and worse the older you get. The connecting points called dystrophin break down as you age, and eventually your muscles literally stop working because the inside works, but there's no way to convey that they're contracting. These three here, so the A, B, and C, are the same problem, but all we're doing is we're shifting who has the trait. And it changes the outcome. So, A. What's the probability that a woman whose brother has Duchenne's will have an affected child? Okay, so we have woman. She wants to have a child with him. She has a brother, he has it. So, for her to have an affected child, what symbol would we use? So diamond means it doesn't matter. Does it matter? Yes, how do you know? Because it said sex linked, and it says it usually affects males. So the symbol matters which means we need you take into consideration when we do probabilities, the symbol that we're using. It's now more than just a simple cross. We now have two factors to follow. So we need to figure out these odds. So if he has it, that means he would be x little a y. That's hard to see. Easier? The glare in here. So, what that means is if I were to look at the parents, the dad would have to be what? This is implied for us to figure out. Well, that has a Y unless we're given an, any other reason to suspect it. And has to be x big A. Why x big A? We were told you're going to die before you get to mating age. Which means the dad can't have it. Okay. So, additionally, that Y has to come from dad. 
So this recessive has to come from mom. But mom doesn't have it, so she must be x big A, x little a. This much we can flat out say. So her, this woman, she has to be x big A. That I know, and the reason why I know that is that A there is that A. The question then becomes, if we're going to have an affected child, what must be the other allele? It must be little a. If it's not the little a, the answer is zero. So what are the odds of this one landing with the woman? So if I look at the mom, I have two choices. So the odds of picking up that little a must be one of the two, one half. To have an affected child, father's probably not going to have it. The father needs to give up the Y chromosome. What are the odds of giving up the Y chromosome? One half. And the mom needs to give up the X recessive, which is one half. So what are the odds of this happening? One half to the third power, which is an eighth. Uh -huh. Yes. When it's sex-linked, you want to indicate that it's sex-linked because that might affect what the outcomes are. Because now it matters if it's a circle or if it's a square. If it doesn't matter, then there's no point in calling it sex link, because sex link only matters if it's a circle or a square. B. Your mother's brother or your uncle has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. What's the probability that you received the allele? So we're asking, did you get the allele. We have you. You are irrelevant. That's why you turn out to be the diamond. You came from mom. Mom has brother. He's affected. So for him to have it, it's x little a y. Oh, we're back in the exact same situation that we had in a. So for your mom to not be affected, she would have to be heterozygous. The odds of her being heterozygous are 1 half. And she would need to pass it on to you, which is one half. One half and one half at last check makes one fourth. Quarter odds of you picking up the allele. We're not asking, are you affected? If you're affected, now I must invoke a sex. But if I'm not asking you whether you have it or whether you're affected, I'm just saying, is the allele there? It doesn't matter. Slight switch in how the wording is used means quite a bit. C. Your father's brother has the disease. What's the probability of you having the allele? We have mom, we have dad, 
we have you, we have dad's brother. Now we have to figure this little puzzle out. Okay. So for him to have it, it has to be x little a y. Your dad doesn't have it, so it's x big a y. So we go get back to the parents. Have to be like this. So what are the odds of you getting it? Pardon? It's zero. Wait, but we didn't do any of the let things being passed on, and and it doesn't matter. I know your dad is this. So where's the recessive allele? Nowhere to be found. Congratulations, your dad didn't give it to you. Can't. Unless we know something about mom, the answer is zero. Always effectively the same setup. We're just shifting the wording or the individual. And it changes the outcome. Let's do a super fun one. Pedigrees for a rare X-linked recessive for deafness. The only person in the pedigree who is deaf is shown. Two people realize that they are distantly related, who are these two individuals here. Generation one, two, three, four. So these are individuals four, five, six, seven, and eight. What we're going to do is we're going to cross 4, 7, and 4, 8. What's the probability they're going to have a deaf girl or a girl with normal hearing? So I have two things to figure out. I need to figure out the odds of a deaf girl and the odds of a girl with normal hearing. Got it. So we can do some backtracking to see where did everything come from. So if I know it's sex-linked, if I take him, well, if it's sex-linked, has to get it probably from mom. So there's mom. Mom, if I trace it back, go to one of these two individuals. I, I'm going to look at a uh, person 4-8. So here... Probably taking it from mom, take it from somewhere in the family, so one of these two. Of these top four, who are the relatives? Generation two. We have one, two, three, and four. Which people are the relatives? Two and three. This is the pathway I care about. When you see a loop, when you can make a loop in a family, this is what's referred to as an inbreeding loop. It's going to be the last set of problems that we do for the entire semester is we're going to do non-random mating when it comes to population genetics. I have a very fun problem. I'll probably put it as homework instead of putting it on the final so that you all don't mute me because you'll want to have time. It's... What if you happen to have a family that had successive pairings between siblings? It's the grossest looking pedigree. It actually just looks like a ladder. Because it's just siblings after siblings after siblings after siblings. And you're just like, this is the nastiest thing I've ever seen. I'll show you some worse ones. So we can see how they're related to each other. We need to start figuring out probabilities of individuals having the recessive allele. So let's start with the bottom. So for him, what is his genotype? So we know he is X little a y. 
So what that means is if I look at his mom, she must be X. Because she doesn't have it, but he had to pick it up from somewhere. And it wasn't from his dad, which means from her, from his grandma, must be X big A, X little A. Are any of those that I wrote in blue up for debate? The answer is no, none of them are up for debate. How do I know? Because he has it. The only way I could have ended up at this situation is if his mom turned out to be heterozygous and her mom had to be heterozygous. This is not a, oh, do we need to figure out the odds? No, this is 100% certain. We know this. I can even jump back one step further. I can even say that great grandma has to be that. She is the source. At least in this pedigree, she's the source. Fire away, Maria. You had a question. Yes. So that's how we know that they're all heterozygous. But where did this recessive A come from? It came from mom. It came from her mom, which came from her mom. The part that we have to question is her side. These are the points where I don't know who that what they turn out to be. So let's take some stabs at it. So if they want to have a deaf girl, to get a deaf girl, I need her to be heterozygous. It's the only way we have this fighting chance. Why? Because we need to have a girl who is recessive. We know that that's what he's going to give up. So we need her to also have a recessive allele. Otherwise, this is not possible. So if she's heterozygous, the only way that's possible is if her mom is heterozygous. And that's only possible if her mom was heterozygous. And that's only possible if her mom's heterozygous. Oh, we know she is. So now I have to beg and call the question is, what are the odds of getting those three heterozygous? Well, the odds of the grandma being heterozygous would be one half. Again, how do I know it's one half? Her dad doesn't have it. So he's, he's irrelevant for this discussion. So it's down to two alleles. That one's not going to answer the question for me. I need that one to pass on. So it's one of the two. That's why it's half odds. What are the odds of her having it? Also half. What are the odds of her having it? Also half. So what are the odds of us getting a deaf girl? So we have our chain of probabilities, which were three of them that I circled. One half times one half times one half. Then we need to have her be a girl who's affected. Those odds would be? One half times one half. I need this to be true, and I need this to be true. What do you get? One half to the fifth power. Two to the fifth. Two, four, eight, sixteen.
Why one more time? Because daddy has to give up this one, not the y, so we need that x. And we need mommy to give up that x that's recessive. This one? Probability chain. Meaning, in order for this to happen, these must also be true. Good. Keep going. Because dad determines sex, mom is going to deliver the death blow. Okay. So, we have two different problems that we're working at the exact same time. We have to set it up so that mom is heterozygous, and that requires this daisy chain of connections. So that's this chunk over here. Needed for grandma to be half, mom had to be half, so she could be half. To get an affected daughter, dad has, can't give the Y chromosome because we don't get to make that claim of daughter anymore. Needs to be the X chromosome from dad. Mom has these two. She gives up this one. Doesn't matter. Not affected. She needs to give up the recessive. So that one also has to pass. Half and a half. So the odds of being a girl is one half. The odds of being a girl who has it is a fourth. The, so this was the first one. The second one says a girl with normal hearing. So how can we come up with that answer? So to come up with normal hearing, what could I have? I could just look at the affected girl. So I can assume all of this still happened. It's just, oops, it's the other chromosome. Do you see that? We can keep doing all of this. So mom is heterozygous. Dad is dad. Dad gives up the recessive X. Mom just gives up the dominant. Boom. We have an unaffected daughter. You see it? Option one. Mom is X A. So what are the odds of that? 1 over 32. How else could we have that happen? So mom could be homozygous, that's true, or what? Well, she could still be heterozygous. We just figured out the odds of if she's heterozygous, that happening. What else could it be? What if her mom turned out to be homozygous? What if her mom turned out to be homozygous? So which combination, like how do we figure that one out? We need to be clever about this one. If we're clever about it, we can solve it. So the odds of us getting her to being heterozygous were what? One half times one half times one half. So an eighth. She had an eighth odds 
of being homozygous or being heterozygous. You all have taken biostats. You did a unit of torture called probability. We need to invoke biostats right now. One option is she's heterozygous. It's one eighth. What's my other option if she's not heterozygous? She's homozygous. What are the odds of it? Wrong. Correct. But based upon this, what are the odds of it? We're talking about. It is not one eighth. It is. Well, it can't be 100% because if that's the other option, 100% plus an eighth equals not 100%. You can't suddenly have all the options equal more than uh, all the options. It's seven eighths. What are your choices? She's heterozygous or she's not. Those are your two choices. You do not have any other options than that. You're heterozygous or you're not heterozygous. What are the odds of her being heterozygous? One eight. So what are the odds of her not being heterozygous? Everything else. She has a seven eighths chance of not being heterozygous. And if she's not heterozygous, game over, we're done. Except we still need to make a daughter. So that's times one half. This is option two. With two ways to get to the answer. If you have two options, there's a two-letter word that we throw in, which is the word or. What does or mean in the world of probability? Add. So I have a 30 seconds option of her having normal hearing. I also have seven eighths times one half, which is seven sixteenths odds of the mom being homozygous and thus wiping out the possibility. So what's my total probability of having a normal hearing daughter? One thirty second plus seven sixteenths, which is the same thing as saying one thirty second plus 14 30 seconds, which is 15 30 seconds. Now we can get to the really fun one. The really fun question. I'm going to read the question one more time. What is the probability that they will have a deaf girl or a girl with normal hearing? Well, the odds of having a girl are what? One half. So, one half odds of having a girl. Technically, that's not true. It's actually a slight advantage being a girl. Slight disadvantage to getting a guy. It, but it's like fractions of fractions of a percent. We round to 50% because otherwise, holy crap, we'll be here all day. So, odds of getting a girl, 50%. What are the odds of her being deaf? 130 seconds, what are the odds of her not being deaf? 
31, 30 seconds. It'd, or, sorry, sorry, it'd be of having the girl who also has normal hearing, it's 15, 30 seconds. If you add them up, what do you get? 16, 30 seconds, which is one half. Basically, that question is saying, what's the probability of having a girl? We could have bypassed all sorts of pain. Do you see it? Do you see, do you see the, the nasty, nasty trick of this? What's the probability of having a deaf girl or a girl with normal hearing? Well, normal hearing plus deaf equals 100% because either you're deaf or you're not. So this question is saying, what's the probability of having a girl? 50%. Now we're all upset at me. It's all about how the questions are worded. Technically, the answer is 50%. So what I would say is, what's the probability of having a girl with normal hearing? I would not put that or. Or I'd say part A, part B. But if you see the question where it's strung together like that, technically speaking, that is a complete statement. So it should be 130 second plus 15 30 seconds, which is one half. Arg! By the way. So probability of being just the girl is half. Because you're either getting an X or you're getting a Y. To be affected, the mom has to give up the recessive allele. So these are the, pause, the problems that either people are like, I love this stuff, or I hate everything and I will burn the mother down. I love these problems. They're so fun. They are so fun. Especially when there's like a nasty little trick that shows up right at the beginning where you're like, okay, let's do the long route. Just to get to four. It's pretty easy. I am not going to do that to you on a quiz or on the final, just so you know. I will not do that bit to you. I would, you would need to give, because I would say show your work, and you'd say 50% odds of getting the X or the Y, 50% odds of getting the X, to da done. And you'd also need to make a statement of deaf or normal hearing adds up to 100%. But yeah, all that work you would not need to do. Last one. Just and Max are considering having a baby, although they are unrelated. They have relatives with a rare autosomal recessive disorder that results in death at an early age. For Jessica, it was her grandmother's sister. For Max, it was his dad's cousin. Record, or records suggest that the dad's cousin may have come from a consanguineous marriage. Okay, that sounds fun. What's the probability that Jessica and Max have an affected child? And then probability of the pet, or draw the pedigree and show the calculation. Okay, so let's draw the pedigree. So we have Jessica and we have Max. Jessica, Max. They are unrelated. They both have relatives. So for Jessica, it was her grandmother's sister. Got it. So we have Jessica, parent, grandma. It did, we're not told which parent, so who cares? Also, we're told it's autosomal. So the circle square thing is irrelevant. I'm just keeping this here so it matches what we see in the story. Okay, so for Max, it was his dad's cousin. So to get to dad's cousin, we need to have dad. Dad needs to have parents. Jump out to cousin. You followed. 
We have dad. For dad to have the cousin, we have to go to dad's parents, sibling of dad's parents, cousin. What's the probability that they're going to have an affected child? Okay. So for us to do this one, here is little a, little a. To get this to work, I have to start making some assumptions about just con max, and I can work backwards for my assumptions. So assumption number one, Jessica needs to be heterozygous. We know she doesn't have it, so she, it has to be heterozygous. Which means parent has to be heterozygous. Which means grandmama has to be heterozygous. We now need to start applying probabilities. Well, when it's a simple parent dropping down, that's simple. Because that one there, it's 50%. So Jessica would be a 50% odds. Jessica's parent would be 50% odds. It's now grandma. Grandma. Well, for them to have an affected child, these two need to be heterozygous. I know she's not homozygous recessive. So what are the odds of her being heterozygous? Not one half. Not three quarters. This is a Punnett square quickly in your head. It's the two-thirds trick. Nope. It turns out that it's lethal as a recessive when you're young, so yeah. So... You make yourself a Punnett square if you can't see it quickly. She's not this. And we know she's not this because she's not filled in. So automatically, I have eliminated an option. So I don't have four choices. I have three choices. And two of those three choices involve being heterozygous. So this is two-thirds. So now let's do Max's side. For this to happen, Max need to be heterozygous. Max's dad needs to be heterozygous. Max's parent needs to be heterozygous. Huh? Because it's not coming from the cross that gave us this. Remember, we're told it's rare. This parent doesn't have it. That parent doesn't isn't the carrier. So this situation does not apply. Because I know this is big A, big A. I know this is big A, big A. It only works when we have the two hybrids. Records suggest dad's cousin may have come from a consanguinous marriage. Consanguinous implies that we can get hybrids on both sides. Which means somehow there's a loop going on over here. And whatever's going on with that loop is you do you. Literally. So, we start applying odds. Odds of Max having it? One half. Odds of Max's dad having it? One half. How about these odds here?
do we have evidence to suggest that Max's grandparents' parents were heterozygous? Do we have any evidence for that? The answer is no. We just know that somehow these two cousins are like, yeah, yeah. So all we need is one recessive allele in there. We just need one recessive allele. So the odds of grandparent would be one half. We invoke the two-thirds rule or the one-third rule or what have you when we're dealing with siblings. Because then I can definitely say that that is the only way I can get that combo. But if I'm being told that there's a loop going on over here, that means, oh, one person has it, and it just trickled down to both of these two, which means it also could have trickled down to there. OK, so we just work the probabilities. Oh, odds of the kid having it. Fourth. So we have the probability chain, which would be 2 thirds times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 halves. We have the odds of having trait, which is a fourth. We need the probability chain to work, and you got to have the kid get it. So it's two thirds times a fifth or a half squared times a fourth. And what do you get? Or sorry, that's not right. That's uh, 64. 3 times 64. 180 plus 12 is 192. You know, for your next quiz, I'm not going to let you use a phone. Or when this shows up, your phone isn't a calculator, right? So hopefully you have a calculator somewhere. Or you can do math. Hopefully, 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 we'll find out. These are fun. Let's talk about maps. Everything that we've done involves genes being able to independently move around. We've had genes interacting with each other. We've had genes that you take them out, you can cause the same resulting phenotype, and then you can complement test them to see that, oh, indeed, there's two different genes. We can have all sorts of weird patterns like incomplete dominance. We can have multiple alleles. We can have a series of them, an allelic series. So far, we've made Mendel's law of dominance not work. The question now is, what's up with independent assortment? Oh, and with sex linkage, we've eliminated the whole concept of segregation. Because if you have the looking at the right traits, it doesn't matter. Same thing if it's cytoplasmic. So that third rule that he had, dealing with independent assortment, let's break it. This is referred to as linkage and linkage mapping. This is gene sequencing before we knew how to sequence genes. So like I said, Mendel had his last particular rule that he came up with is that genes sort independently. Meaning if I had a dihybrid, I can get all sorts of combinations. I can have a big A with a big B. I can have a little A with a little B. I can get a little A with a big B and a big A with a little B. And each of those show up one fourth of the time. It's what we use when we set up Punnett squares. It's our assumption point. Gentleman by the name of Thomas Hunt Morgan said, mm, "No, no, I don't, I don't think this is. I don't think this is right." Even Punnett, who dealt with statistics but also looked at data, 
dealing with genetics. And he was like, I don't think this is right. I, I don't think this mental guy got this one right. They started asking questions like, because Morgan was the guy who said, genes are on chromosomes. What if you had genes on the same chromosome? Do they follow independent assortment? The answer was, it depends. What if the genes are close on the same chromosome? Do they follow independent assortment? The answer is, it depends. What they came to the conclusion of is, because it uh, depends, it's possible that genes can travel together. And they are not breaking apart randomly. That you can have a pack of genes that travel together. Those genes that are traveling as a pack are referred to as linked genes. Or you could say they are displaying linkage. You can see this indirectly with sex chromosomes. Namely because you could have the Y chromosome and on it is a gene called SRY, which is the, quote, male gene, assuming everything else is working just fine, which is a big assumption. And if I look on the Y chromosome, or sorry, the X chromosome, it doesn't have it. So we can dismiss anything associated with, quote, maleness from the starting point if you, have, if you don't have any X or if you don't have two copies of the lab, back of the term truck. If you don't have the Y chromosome, we can eliminate maleness, and thus we can track, oh, this is what's associated always with femaleness, and then we can do combinations thereof. Question number one, how can we find linkage? Easiest thing to do is to do a test cross. Let's just test cross stuff and see what we get. The reason why we like test crosses is this like 9331 crap, none of that applies. Three to one, none of it applies. Test crosses always give you, at most, ones. They could give you some zeros, but you get ones. So if I were to take a dihybrid of A's and B's and cross it with a recessive, a test cross, I should get a bunch of ones which means my phenotype should be about the same number. What's implied here is the parents are usually some type of dominant and recessive. The F1 is usually the hybrid. So we do this, and we are assuming we're going to get one to one to one to one ratio. These are the data we get. You have both dominant phenotypes. You have 817 of you. You have a big A and a little b. You have 39. You have little a and big b, you get 33. And if you have little a, little b, you get 844. So we can run this through a chi-square if we wanted to and beg the question, do these data match quarter, 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 quarter? In case you can't do statistics in your head, the answer is no, they do not match. If, you, if it doesn't look obvious. So then what ratio is it? So we know like 9, 3, 3, 1. Is it like a 12 to 3? Oh, crap, that, that only gives me 3. We need 4. Um, I got nothing. Because I, I kind of only, oh, I know another one. There's a ratio that's 3 to 1, 3 to 1. That one also exists. So, so maybe, maybe, like, because these would match and these kind of look similar. So maybe, like, this is just three times bigger than this one. And what do you say? No. Then I'm, I, I'm out of ideas. When any combination that you can think of that we can derive from a 16 square Punnett square fails us, 
meaning we cannot derive a ratio, the answer is linkage. This is a problem of linkage. It does not fit any known ratios that we would get from a Punnett square. The way that we got what we see here, if I look, my parents were homozygous dominant or they were homozygous recessive. When I look at my phenotypes and my data, my biggest set of numbers came from the double dominant and the double recessive. These two don't match the original parents. The question is, where did they come from? They came from recombination. When we talked about prophase one of meiosis, I pointed out that this is where recombination happens. You'll have crossing over physically rearranging parts of the chromosomes. It was also brought up as a DNA repair mechanism. And it turns out they are virtually identical to each other. The repair mechanism and what happens during meiosis are insanely similar to each other. It's just different circumstances. So what happens? What we're going to have occur is we're going to get a double-stranded DNA break. This is going to be an intentional double-stranded break. We're going to intentionally snip both chromatids. Excuse me, not both chromatids. We're going to snip both strands of DNA. So the forward and reverse strands. What we're going to get in this case is when we get this break, you can't see that, is we actually chop away some of the cut point. So here's the cut point here. We then chop away a little bit. So we have some reactive sides. And what we're going to do is have this piece of DNA, this chromatid, invade the other piece of DNA, the other chromatid. Where did this second one come from? Bless you. Or, sorry, these are actually homologous pairs. This isn't the second chromatid. So this is like the parent, or the mom, here's the dad. So we're going to have the dad invade the mom side, or the mom invade the dad, doesn't really matter. Where did these two come from? The dad copy and the mom copy. Dad gave you this one through sperm. Mom gave you this one through egg. So we can track where these come from. There's something else that should be drawn in, but we're skipping it. There should be another green one right here, another double-stranded green line. What would these be? Nope, not homologs. These are the sister chromatids. So if I look at these two homologs, I was chatting with Dr. Bruslin about meiosis. And she got disturbed because a lot of her students thought you start off with a single strand of DNA and then you make double strand when you go through DNA replication. And it's like, no, 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 no. And she's like, I know. What do you get with, when you go through DNA replication? You started with this green one. The result of DNA replication is I have this green one and the other green one. Just to refresh our brains from the first week of the semester. So the green invades the magenta. 
we then start to replicate. So it's going to replicate out. So it's going to fill in the other side. What that's going to allow is this top chunk here to connect to the other cut piece and we'll replicate the other way. And if we keep going, we then have a question of as we just fill in this gap of where the break was, is how does it undo itself? The way this thing can undo itself is it can undo it so the top is nothing but green and the bottom is nothing but purple, or it can undo itself and the top is purple then green and the bottom is green and purple with a scar left behind. We can actually find these. If you know where to look, you can, you can find the genetic markers of it. When it happens, when it resolves itself, resolution, so it undoes this weird little tango where one chromosome literally gets pulled up onto the next chromosome, we call that a recombination. So we start a repair mechanism. How the repair mechanism separates itself determines recombination or no recombination. There's actually a series of drawings about how this looks, and it forms this weird little star shape. It's called a holiday junction. Holiday with two L's, so it has nothing to do with like Christmas, Thanksgiving, anything like that. But what we can get as a result of this double-stranded break is we can get the chromosomes, or the chromatids more properly, to literally trade spots. What we know is this happens two or three times per tetrad. And it's two or three. It's not one. It's not four. It's two or it's three. We have known it is two or three for decades. And if you were to ask us, why is it two or three? The answer is, because it is. But why? Don't know. Until a paper came out last year that answered a decades-long question, why is it two or three? Here's the paper. It actually examined two genes. One is called HI10, the other one is called ZIP1. And what they found is if you were to do some genetic tricks, so what we can do with genes is we can do a knockdown or we can do an overexpression line. So a knockdown is don't make it work as much. We're not, knock, we're not taking it out. We're just saying, don't do your job as well as you've been doing it. Overexpression line is, do it more. And we can do this by manipulating the gene itself, causing different types of mutations, or we can change the gene regulation of it. And what we found was if you do the right combination between suppression and overexpression, and you get it so you have one recombination event, the cell kills itself. You go from to zero or one recombination events, the cell's like, nope, this ain't, this isn't, there's something wrong, cell's done for. If you overexpress it, meaning let's cause more than the two or three, so let's go to four or five or six, the chromosomes literally shatter. They explode. And that's kind of on the, okay, and now you're done for. It is literally two genes. In this particular case, this was done. Do they show it? Yeah, they have it here. It was tested in Arabidopsis. It was a plant test. So in plants, we have an answer. We don't have an answer for us animals. But this is the first time we could demonstrate this actually has genetic control. We knew it was there. We just had no clue where to look. So, let's draw a recombination event. So draw a pair of homologs in prophase 1, show a recombination event between chromatids 
one and three, two and three, and one and four show the resulting chromosomes. So here, you get options as to how you're going to draw these and where the recombination events are going to be. So in reality, here's how you should draw it, and then why we're not going to do that. In reality, what they look like is this. That's how they would look. They pile on top of each other. Good luck with your drawing and trying to draw the recombination events. This is, this is going to be gross, sucky. I, I'm not going to figure out what you're doing. So let's make the drawing easier. I'm going to use one color for all of this, and then I'm going to use highlighters. Number one, these will be chromatids one and two. For my homolog, I'm going to draw it with squiggly lines. Why squiggly lines? Because it's easier to see. So I'm going to have a cr crossover event, a recombination between 1 and 3. OK, so the way I'm going to show that is between 1 and 3, I make an X. I'm making them cross over. This is saying, at this point here, it's going to flip-flop. In reality, this is way too big. The X actually should look like it's a horizontal line, but we wouldn't be able to see what I did. We're going to do another one between 2 and 3. Uh, I don't know, right here. That sounds fun. And then 1 and 4. OK, uh, here. That sounds fun. I need four different colors. And what we do is you start at the top and you follow the line. That's the goal, follow the line. Then go down to here, cross over, keep going down, I cross over, I drop down. And remember, if you put your crosses in different spots, are in a different order. I just went in the same order, but you could put these in a different order and you will come up with a different combination than I do. That's fine. Second one, let's start down two, jumps over, got it. Three, goes down, crosses over, goes down, hops on over, down, then we'll have four, we go down, 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 we hop over, we're done. I mean, skip one. None of them have been skipped. It, a little bit easier. That's because that just wasn't one of the crossovers. But if you look, you look straight down, there's color from start to finish. Straight down, there's color from start to finish. Color from start to finish. Color from start to finish. So if I were to draw out these chromosomes, or these chromatids, excuse me, here's one, here, nope. Here's two, here's three, Here's four. What it would look like would be straight line, you go squiggles, back to a straight line. We'd be straight line, we get the squiggles. We'd go squiggles, straight line. Back to squiggles again, or squiggles, 
until we get to a straight line. Where you see the switch from straight line to squiggles, the combination event, 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 combination event. You can find them all. Two, three, four. Okay, so now that we can make recombinations, what do you do with the data? It turns out that we can calculate how often genes we combine. We call that frequency of recombination a recombination frequency because we are very clever like that. But how do you know which ones are the recombinants? You always have to find the parents. Step one is always you have to find who the parents are. When we report out a recombination frequency, it's always going to be as a decimal, so point something something, or it's going to be a percentage. The smallest the percent will be is a zero, the largest it could be is 50%. Within statistical norms, it's within 50%. The question is, why 50%? Because segregation is 50%. The separation of the homologs and then the separation of the chromatids should be enough to give you 50%. This is Mendel. So if you happen to have that previous example that I showed you, 817, double dominant, the single dominant, 39, the other single dominant, 33, the total recessive, 844, who are the parents? The parents are the biggest sets of numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find everything that's not the parent. So the phenotypes that are not the parents are going to be that 39 and that 33 because they are a smaller number than 817 and 844. That's all I need to know. So what's my recombination frequency? I add up 39 and 33, and I need to know what's my total. So my total would be 817, 844, 33, and 39. So my total numbers. When I do that division, I get 72 out of 1733, which is 4.15%. Genes A and B recombine 4% of the time, which means the other 96% of the time, they travel as a pair. That's not so bad. Can we do this with three genes? The answer is, of course you could. You just need to keep track of what you're looking at. So if we have three genes, we can have a very fun possibility, and that's called a double crossover. So with three genes, we run the risk of having a double crossover. That is two recombination events happening in the same vicinity. To find the double crossovers, so if we have the two gene system, like an A and a B, the small pair of numbers, that's going to be your recombinants. My double crossovers, because now I have eight things to look at, they're just going to be the smallest numbers here. So given in a three gene system, the smallest number is going to be my double crossovers. So if I tell you these data, can you find me the double crossovers? So plus, 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 what does that mean? We've used this symbol before. All dominant, or we would just say wild type. So the total wild type is a 30. This one here, we would call its phenotype C. 
What is what what does C mean? I don't know. Does it matter? No, it's C. It's not because again, you don't point out everyone's characteristics. You just say, oh, here's the thing that's weird. Hence the big nose story. So, oh, individual C had six. B had 339. What's this phenotype? What would you call it? B, C, 137. A, 142. 291. A, B is 3. A, B, C. So total recessive, 34. Who are my double crossovers? There's a double crossover. There's a double crossover. How'd you find them? They were the tiniest numbers. Also of note, if you look at these, if I look at plus plus C and AB plus, they are opposites of each other. Notice that they are opposites. Wild type, wild type, recessive. Recessive, recessive, wild type. They are opposites. So if you're picking a pair and they are not opposites of each other, you need to try again. They need to be opposites. Okay, so who are the parents? To find the parents, I need the biggest numbers. So who are they? Don't be shy. B and hey, Starbert AC. Because two biggest sets of numbers, and if you look at them, are they opposites? Do they match each other? So B is the recessive, and if I look here, it's A and C are the recessive. They're opposites. Last slide is going to be this one. Interference. That means I need to change the last two problems. Oh, next week you are going to not be happy. I don't know. Because next week is a weird, it's a weird mess with your brain concept. Oh, well. I'm not going to make an additional addendum video for this. We'll just chug it through next week. The double crossovers can be blocked. And that phenomenon is called interference. So the recombination mechanism, when you look at it, all of this has proteins all over the bloody place, holding this thing together and allowing the replication. So if I have a bunch of protein right here, what would it look like if I put all that protein again right next to it? Odds are this isn't going to happen. We're not going to get two recombinations right next to each other. That blockage, the physical blockage, because all my crap is here, but no, I need to also have my other crap here. There's not enough space. It's called interference because it is a physical block. We can measure it indirectly by measuring something that's called coincidence. The summation is 1 equals i plus c, meaning interference and coincidence is 100%. What does that mean? If interference is 10%. Again, last bit. Last bit. That means 10% of double crossovers were blocked from happening. They were supposed to happen, and we automatically said no to 10% of them. It'd be like me saying, 10% of you are going to fail this class no matter what you do. You're done. You're failed already. Well, that sucks. But tell me about the rest of you, if you're not the 10%. That means 90% of the double crossovers. This is actually a stats game. So either you were blocked or 
you happen. We had 90% of the double crossovers were successful. Because either the double crossover happened or it did not. So, yay, we had 90% success. 90% of you passed this class. The problem is 10% of you have to fail. That's how we interpret this. So you know, interference of 10%, it's usually not that low. It's usually a lot higher. I will adjust the problem set for tonight. Martin? Nay. Oh, it came in. Felicia didn't come in. I didn't see her. Wayne came in. She's not here. Alejandro? Oh, you were here. Julian? Remember, if you want an index card for next time, 